Every year, millions of students participate in interscholastic athletic programs. This year alone, more than 7 million participants will take part in sports in America's high schools. Champions were crowned in hundreds of state tournament events around the nation. And in most of those situations, the post-game celebrations went on without incident. However, what would happen if the crowd storms the court following a basketball game and the players are surrounded and feel threatened? Or when basketball players are in the middle of the traditional cutting down of the nets and something unexpected happens? Or imagine a post-game football celebration where fans tear down the goalposts, causing them to fall on those below. These situations are examples of what can happen in high school sports. Each one serves as a cautionary tale on how critical it is to have a clear understanding of the risk management issues facing every high school athletic program. High school sports have provided a generally safe and enjoyable experience for more than a century. In today's environment, parents, athletes, and the courts have become less tolerant of circumstances surrounding injuries. This is especially true if there is any indication of negligence by a coach or administrator. American high school athletic programs have been made safer because coaches and athletic administrators like you have reduced risks through the implementation of numerous procedures and policies that have enhanced the welfare of student athletes. Many of these improvements have resulted from your proactive thought and planning. However, a significant number have evolved as a product of litigation, regulation, and legislation. As a result, in-depth assessments, focused staff orientations, and development of detailed risk reduction plans have become a part of the job for contemporary athletic administrators and coaches. For school personnel, this is an ongoing responsibility known as risk management. Several million students safely participate in high school athletic programs every year. For others, however, serious injuries can cause disappointment and anger, along with a willingness to initiate a legal challenge, particularly when it can be alleged that the cause of the injury was preventable. It is increasingly common for lawsuits to be initiated, asserting negligence on the part of coaches and or school administrators. What is negligence? By definition, it's when a coach or administrator fails to carry out required responsibilities or duties which can be proven to be the direct cause of a player or spectator injury. Negligence is an important concept to understand. To prove that a coach or athletic administrator has been negligent, it must be proven that four elements were met. First, there is duty. A coach or administrator owes a specific duty to the injured player. For example, the coach has the duty to properly train the athlete. Next is breach. Proof that the coach or administrator failed to fulfill that duty. Third is causation. Proof that failure to properly perform a particular duty or duties was the actual and likely cause of the player's injury. Finally, damages. Proof of actual damages or loss. All four elements must be present to prove negligence. There are 14 general areas of concern, which, for ease of reference, we will call duties that you should consider. Not all of these areas of concern apply to every coach and administrator, and some of them may not be legal duties within the meaning of negligence. Even so, for ease of reference, we call them duties in this video. Our comments are designed to help you plan for these areas of concern. Let's take a closer look at each of these duties. Planning is perhaps your most comprehensive requirement. Often, litigation concerning risk management in interscholastic sports come back to key question of how well, or even whether, you and your staff were properly prepared to cope with potential problems. This preparation requires specific written practice plans and constant diligence to prevent or reduce injury in a number of key areas including staff training, medical screening, appropriate consideration of age and maturity of participants and game time conditions, safety of the facility and equipment, response to injuries, warnings to athletes and their families, and insurance of athletes. These written practice plans should be kept on file for several years. 
It's important that there be written communication to players and that copies be on file. Negligence can be alleged not only if there is little or no planning, but also when plans are developed but ignored. The second important duty is supervision of practice and games. Coaches need to be physically present during practices. When a coach or another qualified adult can't be present, ensure that facilities are locked and students are unable to gain access. Coaches should also be able to provide competent instruction and offer structured practices that are age appropriate for the players. It's also important that coaches actively attempt to prevent injuries and, if they do occur, be prepared to respond properly. As athletic administrators, you have responsibilities in this area as well. Not only are you expected to supervise coaching staff members competently, you're expected to supervise events to ensure that spectators do not create an unsafe or disruptive environment. This includes printed and public address warnings and prohibitions to spectators about rushing the playing floor or stadium field after a game. Serious injuries and at least one death have been attributed to post-game celebrations. You also have responsibility for the condition, appropriate usage, maintenance and upkeep of equipment and facilities. In addition, athletic director and coaches supervision extends to other areas such as locker rooms, bus transportation, and any areas in which students call for or wait for rides home. Athletic directors and coaches are required to assess the health, maturity, and physical condition of athletes who participate in sports. Every athlete must be medically screened in accordance with state regulations before participating in practice or competition. In addition, any injured athlete who requires the services of a physician cannot return to practice or competition without written permission of that physician. These procedures should be fully defined in a school policy handbook that is updated regularly by administrators, coaches, and experts. There is also a new area of concern to be considered the difficulty of assessing the readiness of handicapped children who are referred for practice and competition. In these cases, it is imperative that medical and multidisciplinary team approval and recommendation be obtained before a handicapped student becomes a candidate for practice and competition. Coaches are considered trained professionals who possess a higher level of knowledge and skill which enables them to identify foreseeable causes of injury inherent in defective equipment or hazardous environments. Courts have held your colleagues responsible for failing to improve unsafe environments, failing to repair or remove defective equipment, or allowing athletes access to them. Weather conditions must be another consideration. Athletes should not be subject to intense or prolonged conditioning during periods of extreme heat and humidity or when frostbite might occur. It's important that you have a plan for monitoring and responding to dangerous weather conditions. All school or facility building codes and laws must be observed and implemented with respect to capacity, ventilation, air filtration, electrical circuitry, and lighting. As coaches and athletic administrators, you must ensure that athletes are properly equipped with clean, durable, and above all, safe equipment. This is especially important for protective equipment such as football or batting helmets, which must carry a NOXI certification. These items must be checked for proper fit in accordance with the manufacturer's specification and worn properly. Coaches should periodically monitor the fit and condition of equipment, particularly with young players. Athletes must wear protective equipment in practice and competition. Selection of equipment should be age appropriate to the athletes. Instruction at practices must provide a logical sequence of fundamentals that will lead to a natural progression of player knowledge, skill, and capability. Instruction must move from simple to complex and known to unknown. Instructor coaches must be able to also identify and avoid dangerous practices or conditions. Any instruction must demonstrate appropriate and safe technique, as well as warnings about unsafe techniques and prohibited practices. The skills and cumulative readiness of the athlete must be a priority, particularly in sports that feature aerial activities such as diving, gymnastics, and pole vaulting. 
Another important duty is to make sure that athletes are evenly matched in areas such as skill, age, size, and speed. Mismatches should be avoided in all categories. Providing the tools and instruction to help athletes get into proper condition is also very important. Practices should provide a progression of cardiovascular and musculoskeletal conditioning regimens that prepare athletes sequentially for more challenging practices and competitive activities. Certainly weather, personal maturity, fitness levels, and readiness of the student are also considerations. In addition to instructing the athletes, coaches are required to advise or warn parents of any potential risks for injury or death in a particular sport. Athletes and their parents cannot accept risks of which they are not aware. This warning could be issued in writing or through other media. If possible, providing videotapes of warnings to players and parents are recommended. Multiple warnings in different media are also recommended. Any such warning should be documented on the practice plan by date and time, and the plans kept on file for several years, along with the comprehension statements of parents and athletes. As athletic administrators and coaches, you should inquire if athletes have family or school insurance that provides a basic level of medical coverage. Athletes should not be allowed to participate without injury insurance. Coaches are also expected to be able to administer approved, prioritized, standard first aid procedures in response to a range of traumatic injuries. Coaches or trainers should be able to make competent responses in compliance with American Red Cross standards for unconsciousness, airway blockage, and breathing stoppage, as well as shock and circulatory problems such as heart attack or serious bleeding. In addition to a working knowledge of first aid techniques, you must have site-specific plans for managing uninjured team members while emergency care is administered to the injured athlete. Other plans must be in place to ensure access to a stocked first aid kit and other emergency response equipment. Provide access to a telephone to ensure a timely call to emergency medical services with site-specific directions. A script should be written that specifies the street, field, gym, or pool location, driveways, door numbers, and room numbers. This script should be kept at the emergency telephone location or in the first aid kit if a cell phone is to be used. In an effort to expedite rapid access by EMS to the injured athlete, coaches or team members should be stationed at key locations. Transportation to and from events is another area of responsibility for coaches and administrators. In general, bonded commercial carriers should be used for out-of-town transportation. Individuals should always follow their school policy. Finally, as athletic administrator, it is your role to oversee the selection, training, and preparation of coaches and that they provide a safe environment as outlined in each of these areas. Detailed job descriptions should be written and coaching candidates selected based on their ability to best match that description. And on a regular basis, you should evaluate the job every coach is doing with reference to the duties we've discussed. These 14 duties provide you guidelines that should help create a safer environment for students participating in interscholastic athletic and activity programs. There are additional resources available in meeting these obligations. Those are outlined in the NFHS Coaches Education Program at nfhslearn.com and in the NIAAA Leadership Training Program at NIAAA.org.